Uh, we are continuing in our series based on The Chosen, and uh, this week, I hope you had a chance to watch the episode. We had a great time at our uh, discussion group earlier in the week where we watched the episode, uh, where we see the story of Jesus performing his first public sign, uh, the miracle performed at the wedding at Cana. And so if you'd like to turn to the Gospel of John chapter 2, uh, that is where we find uh, this happening, and that's where we're going to be studying to, today. So again, if you'd like to turn in your Bible or navigate on your device to John chapter 2, uh, this morning I am reading from the New International Version. Here's what the Word of God says. On the third day, <clears throat> a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone... Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. The master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had came from, uh, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This was the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee, and thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. And so as we read that story, and just as hopefully you watched in the episode, we see Jesus showing up uh, at this wedding, and then uh, soon after they encounter uh, what, you know, culturally was a really big problem, okay? They had uh, run out of wine. And, you know, it might not seem, depending on uh, your background, that that would be a big deal. But that in this, that would have been like social ruin. It was a big problem that they encountered. And so we see Jesus perform the first of his public signs, the turning of water into wine. And uh, as we uh, look at this passage, and as we see this happening, and even as we uh, have the, the helpful visual aid, of uh, watching on the chosen, I think there are a lot of things that we can learn from Jesus in his first display of power. In fact, there's lots of things we can learn every time Jesus does anything. Uh, but this morning, uh, we are going to focus on uh, his presence at the wedding and what we can learn from even how he displays this miracle. I think one of the first things that we notice, <clears throat> excuse me, as we uh, Look at this happening, look at this performance of the miracle as it gives us some insight into Christ's humility. Okay, Christ's humility. Because, you know, as we know, Jesus is kind of a big deal, right? You know, being God and everything. And yet, he doesn't draw attention to himself in a grandiose way in this. Uh, I love the conversation that takes place, again, uh, in the chosen, and I just want to be clear, I know I've said it a lot, I'm going to keep saying it, that not everything that happened in the episodes of the chosen happened in the Bible, okay? They, it's a show, they kind of take some creative license, but they do a good job. In fact, I think they do a great job. And I like the conversation that's happening along the road where uh, Andrew says about Jesus, you know, he says, do they know how lucky they are to have you coming to their wedding? Do they know what a remarkable thing it is? And it's true because Jesus is God, right? Jesus is the Son of the living God. He is the Christ. He is someone who has unlimited power. You know, I've performed lots of weddings, and we always pray for God's blessing, and we pray for God's presence at those weddings. Well, in this wedding, uh, God was present in the flesh, and it really was a remarkable thing to have this Jesus, Son of God, unlimited in power and in glory. And so it's kind of curious, as mighty and majestic and powerful as he is, 
that his first public sign that he would do would be something that's kind of mundane, almost simple for his power to turn water into wine at a noisy wedding reception. I mean, why didn't he do something, you know, big and, and grand? I know if I had that type of power, that's what I would do. And yet, he doesn't. And he even notes, again, along, along the road when they're talking about, you know, uh, Peter wants to get this thing going. He says, you know, they should announce us right after the guests, and this would be a good spot. Again, this is in the episode, not in the Bible, uh, where we, you know, we can get more followers. And Jesus says, it's not my special day. And I don't know why he didn't, but he didn't. Instead, even in his first public sign, Jesus performs something that only a few people are even aware of. Again, he didn't draw all kinds of attention to himself. He didn't say, behold, for this next trick, I will require assistant. Uh, you there in the robe. Okay, he didn't do that. He didn't uh, draw big attention to himself. In fact, as far as we can tell, the only people that are aware what, of what happened is Mary, the disciples, and the servants of the host. Now, again, uh, that's probably not what I would have done. I think the ability to turn water into wine would be a pretty cool uh, party trick to me. I feel like I could impress people with that, or at least it would be a nice uh, icebreaker. I think that for me, uh, in my tendencies, I would probably be like, make sure everyone was watching uh, before I did such a thing. But again, Christ doesn't do that. And if there was anyone in history who really had the right to draw attention to himself, the right to boast and brag, if you will, Christ was that person. He could have gotten the attention of everyone in that place. But instead, in his humility, he offers a secret wedding gift. We see his humility. The second thing that we notice in the text is Jesus' relationship with his mother, as she seems to be directly involved. Now, uh, one of the things uh, that happens in the episode is it kind of develops this backstory where uh, Mary has a relationship to uh, the family of the groom. Now, we don't know who Mary had the relationship with uh, in, in the Bible, but it is clear that Mary is connected to this family somehow, and she's connected in a deep way. And the reason we know that is because she's aware of the problem. Okay, like I said before, this running out of wine was a big deal. Okay, these, these wedding feasts, uh, they were different than what we have uh, now in that they went on for days. Okay, and running out of wine, I cannot stress enough what a, what a terrible, that would have been like social ruin and it wouldn't have been a problem that just lasted for a day or so. It would have been humiliating uh, in the deepest way. And so we can see that the fact that she is even aware of this circumstance shows uh, that she's involved with the family. The other thing we see, and perhaps what tells us even more, is that she knew what to do about the problem. So we have this problem, we have this big problem, what does she do about it? Well, she goes to Jesus. That'll preach, eh? I think we can apply that uh, almost everywhere. you got a problem, we can take it to Jesus. And so, obviously, she has some recognition that Jesus can handle the problem. Now, we don't see her going, hey, Jesus, there's a bunch of water, can you turn it into wine? Okay? She doesn't give him suggestions. You know, sometimes we like to do that when we go to Jesus with our problem. Hey, God, I've got this problem, can you fix it in this way? Uh, she goes to Jesus, and she just lays the problem before him and trust that he can handle the situation. She even displays her confidence in him when she says to the servants, do whatever he says. I don't care if he says to hop on one leg and you know rub your tummy and pat your head, spin in circles. If he tells you to do it, just do exactly what he says. And the response that we read in the text can kind of be uh, misleading. Because when you look at it, it says, Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. And when you read that, it sounds harsh. Like it sounds like he, it sounds almost like it's dismissive. 
And I thought that they did a really great job. Again, I hope you had a chance to watch the episode. If you didn't, I encourage you to watch it soon. Um, but in the episode, we can see uh, what we see when we look at the text in its original language. If you look at it in Greek, the response sounds much more gentle. Like, never mind. Don't be afraid. It sounds much more uh, reassuring than it does harsh. It sounds a lot more humble. And uh, the way that they speak to one another really shows that Mary understands that she is to worship Jesus, but it also shows that Jesus respects his mother the way that he ought to in terms of who she is to him. And again, we just see that uh, humility of Jesus shine through. And again, in the episode, I think they do a great job of showing that relationship and showing the, the tenderness and the respect that exists there. You know, I love in the episode when they first encounter one another that, that Jesus, you know, embraces his mother. In fact, he even picks her up. And after he has performed uh, the miracle and they've brought the wine to uh, the the banquet master, and everybody is enjoying it and, and celebrating this grand gesture. And you can see uh, they exchange a glance across the room, and she kind of mouths, thank you, and he nods. And there's just this moment that exists, and they do just such a great job of making you, I think, feel what you're supposed to feel and understand the relationship that exists there between Jesus and his mother. See, I think at least in part... In this exchange, he's just doing what she asked him to do. And, and yes, don't lose sight here that in Jesus' respect for his mother, that uh, we understand that Jesus was above her. Okay? He's still God and he's still uh, to be worshipped. Okay? Jesus, you know, I, I just, it's hard to imagine raising Jesus. You know, we have that scene at the start of the episode where it goes to where Jesus gets lost in the caravan and they end up finding him at the temple. Uh, but Jesus is above Mary, you know. Jesus could have been like, you know what, Mom, why don't you clean your room? Okay, that's, uh, we don't have any record of that. But he is God and he is above her. And yet, we see this humility in his exchange with her. And we see the tenderness that exists in the relationship uh, between them. Now, finally, despite his amazing humility, Jesus, in this miracle, also shows us his humanity. His humanity. I find that sometimes we get so wrapped up in the deity of Jesus, and that's not a bad thing, uh, but we, we look at Jesus so much in terms of his deity and re remembering that Jesus is God, that sometimes we forget that here on earth that he walked as a man with human flesh and experienced the essence of human life, okay? The, all the, the ups and downs, the hurts and the joys. He was a real person that had feelings and a whole bunch of them, okay? It wasn't just preachy Jesus all the time or joyful Jesus. Jesus had emotions. Sometimes he got ticked off. If you want to keep reading in chapter 2, you'll see where he... Uh, went into the, the temple where they were scamming people and the money changers, and he goes in and he flips the table. Okay? He had real emotions. Sometimes Jesus got annoyed, like when the disciples just still had so little faith and they kept asking him all kinds of stupid questions. Okay? And keep watching the chosen. Uh, that's coming up as well. Just the same also as any warm blooded human being, Jesus like to, get ready, I'm going to blow your minds, Jesus liked to have fun. Okay? Jesus enjoyed life as well. Uh, I, as much as Jesus loved people, I can well imagine that Jesus liked a good party. Okay? And sometimes we just so remember the stories where Jesus maybe has hark rebukes for the Pharisees or maybe where he gets frustrated with the disciples that we often forget how people saw him. Okay? People, Jesus always drew a crowd. People wanted to be around him. Remember, one of the accusations, or a few of the accusations that was often made against Jesus was that he was a glutton and that he was a drunkard. And while those 
accusations were not true. It definitely gives us the indication that this wasn't the only party that Jesus ever attended. And again, I think that sometimes we just have this uh, one-track, somber, stern version of the Lord. And that any portrait we see of him, and I've told you many times, this is a pet peeve of mine, and I'll probably say it a thousand more times, but whenever we have a portrait of Jesus, he just looks kind of slumped and, and somber or sad, and we don't realize, or maybe not that we don't realize, but we forget this joyful side of the Master. The thing that we need to realize about Jesus is that Jesus was not a killjoy. In fact, he was both figuratively and literally the life of the party. David A. Redding had this to say about him in the context of this miracle. He says, John is trying to make clear what the cheater in us wants to forget, that Christ alone is the life of the party. Without God right beside them, the human side of man dies as they indulge in a repetition of the same old orgy of coarse animal spirits, reverting to their usual weakness and faults the same way they regretted the last time they are still trying to forget. Conversation becomes loud and dull, harder and heavier-handed, cheaper, until finally some souls are put to sleep and some go to the dogs And the discussion descends. How ugly the wedding reception becomes without him. What a miracle he brings to it. Where he goes to this party, they've run out of wine. And so Jesus turns water into wine. Now, I think at this point too, it is important that we are hermeneutically accurate. And hermeneutics is just proper handling of God's word, making sure that what we're getting out of it is what it truly says. And it's important here to understand that it was wine that he turned it into. Yes, like real wine, not strong grape juice or whatever you might feel better about it being. Uh, Remember, in the text here, it says that they would serve the best wine first on a regular basis. Why? Because After people had too much to drink, uh, they wouldn't notice the cheap stuff. And I know that for some people that that makes them uncomfortable. And, you know, I've heard people say, oh, well, it wasn't really wine. It was just grape juice. Well, I don't think that anybody's been cut off from grape juice because they've had too much. Um, I've never seen that. But... Uh, it, it's real wine, and but again, don't let that be a stumbling block for you if it is a stumbling block for you because the wine is not the point of the text. Okay? It is the miracle worker who is the point of the text. Jesus and who he is and what he is doing and what he will do is the point of the text. And I think we can take a lot from this generous act of Christ. And that he displays his always humble example in this secret wedding gift. And he even shows his humility in how he interacts with his mother. We see here that Christ is not some sort of cosmic killjoy. After all, his first miracle was going to a party and making it last longer. But here is what I want you to understand this morning. Is that once this happened, the people who encountered Jesus in this way had to make a choice. Because we cannot be indifferent to Jesus. Okay, Several weeks ago, uh, Harley preached at one of our online services. And he said over and over, and and I, I love it, he said, You cannot encounter Jesus and not be changed. Because as soon as you encounter Jesus, you have to decide what you think about him. You have to decide which way you will go. You cannot be indifferent to Jesus. This was the first of his signs. We would see and will see bigger and better and greater things. And yet even this turning water into wine is still enough to give us pause and it causes us to ask who is this Jesus and what does it mean 
Who is this Jesus and what does it mean? These are important questions and they are welcomed questions. Uh, I like, again, in the episode, we have the uh, interaction between Jesus and Thomas. And Thomas says, I see no logical way to a solution here by what you are doing. And Jesus says it's going to be like that sometimes, but he says, I don't rebuke you for asking questions. It is good to ask questions. It is good to seek understanding. And so the servants who pour the water are faced with this question. And the people who encounter Jesus, his disciples, his own mother, everybody is faced with this question. Who is this Jesus and what does it mean? And we see uh, as Jesus is performing the miracle in the episode, uh, laid over top of that is this conversation between Mary and Thaddeus. Again, it's in the episode, it's not in the scripture. But we're talking about Thaddeus being a stone cutter. And he says that once you make that cut into the stone, it sets off It cannot be undone, and it sets in motion a series of choices. And once we encounter Jesus, we set in motion a series of choices as to whether or not we are going to accept him, as whether or not we are going to follow him and acknowledge him as Lord. We have to make the choice. We have to make the decision. And we see the disciples' response in verse 11. So what Jesus did there in Cana of Galilee was the first of signs in which he revealed his glory. And the disciples believed in him. That was the disciples' choice that they made. In response, it was to believe in him. Not to stay in the dark. But as John said to Nicodemus in the episode, there are some who are in love with the dark. And they do not want to be awakened. And they refuse to believe. I wonder which one you'll be. And so as we consider who Jesus is and the humility and the graciousness that he displays, even in performing miracles, you and I have to decide how we will respond to Jesus because make no mistake we all respond we either follow him or we choose something else 